and I'm really thrilled to talk about uh, a really exciting uh, endeavor we've been up to for the last year. So as Anna mentioned, I, I've had the pleasure of speaking here in my previous role in geospatial application building and got to show really cool things about climate change. And, and uh, I've spent more than 15 years of my life working in conservation biology and using maps and data to help uh, people uh, understand the environment and, and better know the world. And, and I've now taken on, since last summer, this new role of being executive director of this new data science institute here at Berkeley to even broaden that, that further into almost any and every research uh, field that's involved in scientific discovery. So it's been a really wild ride. Uh, I think it's pretty clear to, to all of us that nearly every field of discovery is transitioning from data poor to data rich. So from astronomy to oceanography, biology, et cetera, there's just massive amounts of data out there. Um, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of things about it. So on this campus alone, there's been tons of efforts in previous years by really huge people and organizations around helping to build tools and uh, engineer products and, and build communities around helping uh, research science uh, through what we are now calling data science by taking big amounts of data and services and, and making great products and uh, decision support tools around them. So BIDS launched in December 2013 here in this room. Uh, really didn't get started till I started in the, the summer after that in uh, last July. And we didn't even move into our, our new home in Doe Library, as I'll explain, till last sub September. So it's been a, a really uh, fast-paced year where a lot's been happening. And this effort or originally got started by a faculty group of, of superstars here on the campus that really represent a diverse background of, of departments and domains. And we're led by Saul Perlmuter, the Nobel Prize winner in physics, who's our, our director. Uh, but we have 12 wonderful co-PIs that represent in green a lot of the different domain sciences and in blue a lot of the different methodologies. And so this all came about in a large part because of a, a large grant by the Moore and Sloan Foundations for $12.5 million that really is interested in what they're calling the data science environment and how data science can help improve research and scientific discovery at an academic institution like Berkeley. We also have industry support from Siemens and State Street, and the university itself has really uh, come through in a large way to, to help us. Uh, for the Moore and Sloan Foundation grants, this award was also given to two other universities, NYU and UW, uh, who also have similar institutes in their own institutions. And we actually work very closely, uh, the three of us, and look at how the problems that we're seeing here in Berkeley may or may not relate to the problems they're seeing in their respective institutions. And we meet up annually to, um, to work together on all of these issues. So some of the goals that we, we have at BIDS are to support meaningful and sustained interactions and collaborations between these science domains like life sciences, social sciences, physical sciences, with the methodology fields like computer science, statistics, and applied math. Uh, we're also very interested in establishing new data science career paths at the university that are long-term and sustainable. So much like you're hearing about all of the uh, hiring issues that they have in, in businesses, there's actually an uh, almost opposite problem at the university where we have a lot of very talented data science uh, researchers who don't really have very good options if they want to grow in their field here at the university. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and lastly, building an ecosystem of analytical tools and research practices. Uh, so we, we have a lot of people who are building software tools and, and uh, enabling scientists to spend more time focusing on their science. But really, when it comes down to is people, and I think you've heard this a lot in, in the previous talks as well. Uh, this is how we work. We have a lot of great people doing a lot of great things, and it's the community that really drives all this home. So um, what you're seeing in the top row of pictures here are our data science fellows. Uh, and most of these folks work with us at a 50% time model, where we've taken folks from all over campus in different departments that were kind of the rock star data scientists of their departments and given them an opportunity to work with us at half of their time 
and these are postdocs and research scientists, and they're able to now try to take that half of their time to do something bigger and better than they might have done should they have just been uh, doing things business as usual in their own departments. And the hope is also that they're learning from one another. So we have an astrophysicist sitting next to a biologist sitting next to an environmental scientist. Um, and they're learning from each other and realizing that some of the problems one had had already been solved in the other field and vice versa, and taking that information back to their home departments. We also have a number of senior faculty, senior fellows uh, on the bottom who, who also represent a, a large swath of the community here, and everybody has been just really fantastic. I took this list of people and created this, um, this list of the different departments that people come from, and it really drives home the fact that this is really diverse group, and they're really working together here. Um, you know, we have people from sociology, nuclear science, seismology, computer science, you name it. And in addition to the diversity of domains and methodologies, the projects that they're working on, and particularly in software development, also have a, a, a large range of diversity. So we have some of the folks building really amazing tools in R, really amazing tools in Python, Julia, you name it. And um, it's been really great to see the, the influence that each other have on each other uh, in building these tools as well. Uh, I'm going to call out three uh, really quick specific instances that, that have just come up recently that I think exemplify some of the great things happening here by our fellows. Katie Huff is a nuclear engineer who's been working with us this year as a postdoc. Uh, she's actually just publishing this book uh, called Effective Computation in Physics. I told her I'd plug it, check it out. Um, <laughs> it's really a, a fantastic resource that drives home a lot of the same hacking skills that actually transfer, transfer beyond physics, but in this case, she's using all of these uh, opportunities to, to bring home to her field in nuclear engineering uh, the types of skills that, that are needed to do good work. Karthik Ram has is, is been working for a long time on this program called R OpenSci in R, which is a fantastic uh, suite of tools that, that does amazing things. If you're involved in R, I highly recommend you check it out. As one brief example with a project I previously had an opportunity to be involved with in my previous life in geospatial world with, with mapping and bi biological sampling, um, the museums here on campus have over a million specimens in their archives, and many of them have been geolocated as to where they were collected and when, and we've created an API around all of that data. There's over five million records of specimen locations, and that's one of many different kinds of data in this API called the Berkeley Equinformatics Engine. Um, if you're a programmer and want to spend a lot of time building something like an interactive web map, you can do so, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. With our OpenSci, you can use this one line of code and generate a beautiful map in Mapbox that, that's really simple. Uh, lastly here, Project Jupiter. You may be familiar with IPython, and Fernando Perez is one of our co-PIs in this effort as well, and he's a, a really big contributor to the BIDS community, and they, uh, him and his team of, of developers have been working really hard at converting IPython to this new Jupyter project. And the idea there is that uh, the interactive IPython environment is being moved into a world where it's agnostic to language. So Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R, and, and you can use these same interactive environments with, with all of these languages now. And uh, I, like I said, space is really important. A lot of this uh, wouldn't be able to, to happen without uh, this really amazing space we have in, right in the middle of campus in Doe Library. This map represents in yellow all of the different buildings in campus where data science is happening. And of course, it's just a campus map because pretty much data science is happening in every building on campus. And uh, so being right at the heart of that is really excellent and is, enables us to, to help build that community and bring people together. So um, you walk into Doe Library and turn left and we're right there. And there's a lot of, uh, it's a collaborative space and a lot of different great ways that we can use it. Um, what we share with the more Sloan effort between UW, NYU, and Berkeley are something we're calling uh, the six working groups. And the idea is these working groups are centered around identifying problem areas and challenges that uh, 
would entail connecting the scientific theme areas that I talked about and the data science methodologies. And so their career paths and alternative metrics, education and training, software tools, reproducibility, working spaces, and ethnography and evaluation. And I'll, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about each, because I think they touch on a lot of the, the problems and interests that a lot of these talks and a lot of both academics and, and business folks uh, have to think about. So career paths, this one is a little bit in specific to the university, as I mentioned, because we have some fantastic data scientists uh, among our fellows, for instance, who want to remain in academia and, and have a tenure track position as a professor, but they're writing code and they're writing the software that everyone is using to produce great papers and, and publications, but maybe they're not producing a lot of publications because they're writing the code. And in traditional hiring committees, that's kind of frowned upon, so there's not a great path forward. So we're looking at how do we build on alternative metrics to, to make these folks more attractive to traditional hiring committees here at the universities. Um, education and training is obviously important in all of these regards, and there's many opportunities to do that on a campus like this and beyond with the web. Um, and we're hoping to build upon that. You know, most of the folks we work with are self-taught, and so how do we get beyond just offering uh, opportunities to, to teach yourself, but uh, having activities like workshops and, and boot camps and different ways to, to help people learn how to be a good data scientist. Um, software tools and environments. This working group is led by Fernando Perez, and they really are taking this open source charge that's been fantastic to see and, and building this next generation of tools that researchers can use. Reproducibility and open science is led by Philip Stark, chair of statistics here, and it's really all about um, providing uh, good opportunities and, and stories and learning experiences to help people better understand how to do open science and open research. And ethnography and evaluation, uh, we actually have, uh, led by Catherine Carson, a small team of, of social science experts who are looking at data science from the inside and coming up with ethnographic, eth, uh, ethnographic evaluations of, of how things are, are working and what could be improved and how data scientists work together and work with others in the university. And then lastly, working spaces and culture is about the fact that we are all people and that we have a place that we need to work together and, and how do we uh, come up both with the spaces and the, the um, activities to, to make that happen. One of the things that, that has come to mind with this that's been interesting to hear, especially from people who were coding back in the days where well, you really had to go visit your department's big computer and spend the night there to run your code and get your answers. And we don't really have that anymore. You can do it on your laptop. Uh, but one of the things that was lost in that transformation from having to go to the source to do your work to now being able to do it anywhere is just that one-on-one -on -one inter the human in to human interaction of hanging out with the fellow scientists and doing the work together and, and having those ideas, those water cooler moments. And so that's a little bit of what we're hoping uh, we can reproduce here. Um, and then we just have a number of different more public facing uh, activities that, that we hope can help engage both people on this campus and off. We have a data science lecture series where we have speakers both come from industry and academia and share their experiences in this world. Um, there's a lot of great videos we've been recording here that you can check out on our website, uh, including uh, Mike Magursky from Code for America was here and gave a great talk last semester. Uh, Hacker Within has been a fantastic uh, group started again by Katie Heff, one of our fellows, and Rachel Slabaugh, a professor in nuclear engineering. And they had a small peer-to-peer -peer learning group that existed in meeting rooms for nuclear engineers to learn how to hack. And we asked them to bring it to a, a bigger scale and, and include others outside of their field, and they've done that. Uh, and it's been a really neat way, basically, for people to get together and have a little bit of a lecture, a little bit of a training, and a little bit of a hacking session to, to learn all of these skills. And then uh, actually started by an iSchool uh, master student, Anthony Swain, is the Data Science Collaborative, where they uh, have been taking undergraduate and graduate students and forming small teams to hack on a project for an entire semester uh, that have been presented by different groups who have projects that they would like help with, uh, both all from government, startups, finance, and scientific research. And they just presented their findings uh, this week, and, and it was really fantastic to see these groups uh, 
coming up with, with great data science outcomes, but also learning in the process of doing it. Um, and that's all I have today, but check out our website and I'd be happy to chat with any of you. I know you all <laughs> have been, uh, had a long day, so I'm, I'm happy to chat offline too. Uh, kind of a separate entity from here. So how much of your uh, training boot camps, uh, uh, those uh, accessible to the MEETS program, and uh, how much can you take advantage of or also contribute? Yeah, they're open to anyone here at the university, and I would love to see more MEETS folks get involved. Uh, we'll be working with Software Carpentry in particular on the boot camps. Um, and so, you know, they do workshops all over the country. And so some of our fellows are very involved with Software Carpentry, and we'll be doing at least two or three uh, boot camps a year that are coming right out of their curriculum. Mm -hmm.